Well, um, as a new member, Richard, thank you very much for volunteering to uh, give this talk. Uh, I think it's going to be about um, a, a talk and a practical demonstration of a uh, QRP uh, Duino based transceiver. Is that correct? Um, importantly, it's suitable to be built at, uh, as a club activity or even at home. So uh, I'm sort of very interested in this because uh, as a new amateur, I'm looking for these types of uh, projects. Um, I don't know a great deal about Richard's background, but he spent 20 years in corporate life in the US and um, he had time to be an active member at a uh, Fort Knox Cowtown Radio Club. Fort Worth. Fort Worth. Fort Worth. Fort Worth. Fort Worth. <laughs> <laughs> they wouldn't let me into Fort Knox. Is Cowtown an actual place? Or? That's, that's the uh, colloquial name for Fort Worth in Texas. It's, it's, right? it's called Cowtown. We'll, yep. something well, I won't do too much of some of the Richard, so over to you, and All right. thank you very much. Thank you. Does anybody mind if I sit down while I go through this? Because there's a fair number of things to operate, and it's going to be easier if I do that, and I think you can probably all see me. So, But more importantly, it's, it's probably important that you, uh, you, you see the, the, uh, the board up through there. So look, today, oh, what, it's my pleasure to sort of talk to you about a, a couple of things. I, I wanted to talk about the Build-A-Thon program that we ran in the, the Cowtown Amateur Radio Club. Um, and the ADX and, and building this as a club project was very much part of that particular program. So I'll introduce that to you. I'll talk about some of the, the projects that we, uh, we built last year, some of the things that we're doing this year. Before I go on to go into the, the ADX in a little bit, uh, bit more detail, just by a quick way of background uh, to, for, for me, um, I've been licensed since about the late 1970s. Um, initially in Canberra, then down in Victoria, then down in Tasmania. Then I had a big gap when family came along and did various other bits and pieces to distract me. Um, got back into radio here in New South Wales probably about uh, seven or eight years ago. And uh, when I went back to the US with my, my job, I was fortunate enough to, uh, to link up with the Cowtown Abitur Radio Club. Uh, I became licensed in the US as well. I had to do all of my exams again. Uh, if I wanted a US call, uh, but that was a lot of fun and uh, it was all, all part of that journey. So uh, I've now retired, came back to Australia late last year and uh, lucky enough to find you guys. So um, ho hopefully you'll enjoy what I have to, to talk about tonight and uh, it's my pleasure to be able to share this, uh, this with you. So let's talk about the Build-A-Thon program and what it was and, uh, and what we set out to, uh, to do. It really was a, a club event that we, we decided to put on. And I guess, you know, you can read through all there, promotes the hobby, generate interest amongst the membership, promote learning and development of skills, um, building membership and its participation. It actually did a great job of that. We almost increased our membership by 20 to 30% as a result of people's participation in the, in the Build-A-Thon program. But it also generated much more higher attendance at the meetings and also, I think, a, a much uh, fantastic feeling of camaraderie, among, camaraderie amongst everybody as they, uh, they did. You know, in reality, it was about having fun, but it really did put some life back into the, in, into the club as we, uh, as we went forward. When we look to design projects for the, for the Build-A-Thon, we're looking, first of all, it had to be relatively expensive. We set as a target that any one project was never to cost more than $50. Um, it was to be easy to build using through-hold components and deliver an ex a learning experience. In the US, we have a, uh, or there is a, the first class of license that you get is called the technician class. It's a relatively uh, easy exam to sit compared to the other ones, but a lot of people come in, uh, sit the technician class, and they really don't have a background in electronics or radio, but they're yearning for that. And instead of just working with a handheld radio, which is, you know, the UHF, which is pretty much all they can do, they do have limited privileges on, on the 10 metre band. It was really a great opportunity to get these folks involved in the club, start learning. And hopefully the, the benefits of that will come out as I, as I go through some of the next uh, few slides. It needed to be a practical project that once the project's been built, someone can actually take home and use. It's not something you're going to put in the bottom drawer and never use or pull out again. And really, we hope to try and give people the confidence, having built something, to go on and continue to explore and learn and build better in things as we, as we went through. These are some photographs uh, of the, the guys um, doing the, uh, the Build-A-Thon, um, various stages, as you can see. N nobody's not having a good time. They, uh, they really did enjoy the, the process as we went through. So last year, we set out to, to, to use three projects. 
The first project that we set out was the NFED half wave antenna uh, there on the left. The second project we moved on to was the, uh, the, the ADX, the QRP digital mode transceiver. And the third project was the QRP manual antenna tuning unit. Now I've got all of those here actually, having said that. What did I think this, I think this is my ATU in here. No, it's not. I'll just pretend I'm still sitting down talking to you as I, uh, as I look for this, there it is. I did bring them all along this evening for people to be able to, uh, to look at. And there's the, the ATU that we, uh, we built last year as well. So I'm going to talk about this. The, the main thing was that each of these were designed to work with one another. They weren't just standalone. So obviously having built the antenna, that was a relatively simple thing for us to do. Let's just talk about that. Um, you know, inexpensive, easy to build, but it introduced people to techniques around soldering, winding toroids, what particular components to select, why you would choose one toroid over another, um, the construction techniques. We also were able to introduce the theory of tuning antennas and get people, not, not only did we have a, a, a theory lesson about NFED half waves and how to build them, we had people out in the field actually cons throwing them up into trees, getting them tuned, establishing two-way communications with one another on the, on the way through. And just a couple of pictures that you can see here. Uh, the top left photograph there was a prototype around one of the club members' homes that they actually built before. We, by the way, a couple of us were selected and we, we built the prototype to find out how it worked, what, was, what the foibles were, if you will, so that it wasn't something that we're building from uh, first round, if you will, when we came to doing the build-a-thon. We'd had club members who'd built it, had a learning experience, and were able to then assist others as we went through. Um, the bottom middle photograph there, you can see the various types of NFED half-wave antennas we, we offered. We focused on a portable one. In fact, the little baby one that you can see here, this guy here, that's actually it there. It doesn't get much smaller than that. Um, works beautifully well on, uh, on QRP. Um, please feel free to come up and have a look afterwards. That was about $6 to build. You know, it, it, it doesn't get much cheaper than that. But we had several different types there. And um, as you can see on the next slide here, it also taught the foundation skills for people to then be able to go on and build something that was for higher power. So if you, weren't, if you didn't want to just focus on QRP, if you wanted to go and build rather than a portable, just get back there, these ones were all designed for portable operations. You go out in the field, throw, throw a piece of wire up into a tree and, and work away. If you wanted to go on and build something a little bit more substantive, in fact, here's, here's one that some of the guys in the, the club built. Uh, that'll handle about 150 watts or thereabouts. Um, you know, people had the foundation skills to, be go, to go on ahead and go on and do that. And I'll put my glasses on so I can see what I'm looking at here. So that's fundamentally what, what, what they looked like. Uh, you can see the one on the top right hand side. That's what that funny shaped uh, device on the left looks like. So you can wind a halyard and the, uh, uh, the, um, the wire around it. So you've got a self-contained unit very easily. In fact, I don't have that one, but for those that are interested here, this little pouch contains a halyard, an NFED half wave, uh, the antenna itself, the unun, and everything like that. So it's something you can easily just throw in a bag, throw in the car when you go out in the field and, uh, and use it as you go. As we approached each of the particular projects, we split them into basically three phases. The first was a presentation evening where we talked about what we're doing, the theory of, of the operational or whatever it was that we were looking to uh, su support. And then we had a series of construction days or construction mornings. In the case of the NFED half wave, it was a simple uh, morning activity. It was a very easy, quick build for people to be able to do. And then w for those that wanted to, we'd follow up with, um, I said, for the keen and enthusiastic erecting and tuning antenna, perhaps going out, doing a POTA activation, parks on the air activation for those that are not familiar with it, and establishing communications with, with other club members and perhaps others around to really give people a feel good feeling that what they've just built works. And uh, they really did. Uh, we also, um, <laughs> We turned each one into a bit of a social event as well. There's on the bottom right hand corner there where we were the, the, right next door to the clubhouse there was a little Mexican uh, uh, restaurant and we, we'd start breakfast there. We'd all go and have breakfast and then we'd move across the clubhouse and do the, uh, do the activity as we, as we went along. What's coming up next? Just quickly then um, talking about the, the ATU. 
that, uh, that we've got here. Um, this was the, the last of the projects that we ran last year. Um, and it was really, uh, again, as I said, complementing what we had done before with the other two kits. So the, the antenna worked with the QRP unit. We also had an, an ATU that, uh, that went with it as well. We took and modified the, um, the cheap Chinese um, manual day kit. You can buy these things on, on Amazon for about, uh, I think they're about 14 US dollars, so probably about $20 Australian. Uh, but as with most of those things, the instructions are poor. They're actually wrong. Um, they, they're not correct in terms of, <laughs> of, of, of how they did it. Um, and so we, we fixed all that, uh, and you can see here, um, the, on the top right hand, on the right hand side of the screen here, you can see the uh, construction manual that I put together so that people could actually build it. Um, the stars indicator changed from what we had, uh, from the basic kit. In the middle center there, you can see the star, um, which is here. We, we put in an, a, an antenna bypass switch. We solved the problem with the poor connections between the knobs and the uh, Vericon um, capacitors here. Uh, we managed to source a different shaft and connection mechanism so they didn't keep falling off. It, it works with a high degree of authority. Uh, we had some additional knobs and various bits and pieces, and we changed the uh, the wire that was supplied with it. The stuff that was supplied with that kit is so thick, you're not going to be able to wind that effectively around to produce this uh, multi-tapped uh, switch, tapped multi-tapped toroid down here. Whoops, went back one. And also, we produced the templates and uh, we, we designed the, the fairly nice looking interface at the front to make it look very, uh, very attractive and usable. So that was the last project that we built. But again, with each of them, we were able to utilize the, the theory involved in it. We spent a, an evening going through so that people knew what they were building and it put the, the theory of operation in the context of the build. So that was again, part of the, the journey for each of the, each of the projects. Well, if we come to the main event, uh, that's talking about the, uh, the ADX. And I won't lift it up because it's actually connected and operating down here, but that's this little thing that you can see there. Having said I wouldn't lift it up, I just lifted it up. Um, you can see it's, uh, but there it is on the, on, on the screen. So let me just f quickly switch to a, a video. If I can work out uh, this here, which will introduce the, the ADX to you. And um, that'll be a good starter, I think, for what we're trying to uh, communicate today. So theoretically, the audio will work as soon as I hit this button. If it doesn't, we'll see where we go. Whoops, it's not even on the, uh, on the right screen. Then move across to the VFO, 
And once that's installed, we then add the control buttons on the other side, and it's not long before we can start to undertake the first test on the VFO. We're looking for a one megahertz uh, frequency signal coming out of the VFO. Don't worry, if you don't have the test equipment, we'll have people there that are able to use it and can test and work with you as you progressively make the build. Add a few discrete components and move on to the power amplifier section. Install the power transistors and then finish off any low pass filters that you need to complete your kit. It's not long before we're ready to start testing it out and connecting it up to see that everything works. Now I recorded the power output from each of the, on each of the bands on the unit that I built across a range of input voltages. We're focusing on 12 volts, which is where we're targeting. We went from 4.4 watts on the 40 metre band down to 2 watts on the 10 metre band, which is perfectly adequate for digital modes, as you'll see in the next couple of slides. So what we end up with is a really fantastic, neat little unit, which provides hours and hours of fun and excitement as you work the HF band using digital modes. You can see here, I just, this was the first time I set it up and used it, signal coming in across the top, two-way QSO is taking place on the right. If we go across to see where the signals are being heard on Grid Tracker, you can also see the spots from my transmissions, which are finding their way all across various areas of the United States. I also switched on the Whisper and left the Whisper beacon running for a while. You can see here, even with a small number of watts, I had signals going all the way to Australia and down to New Zealand, across to Europe, as well as all the way across the United States. And if you think I'm running a really big antenna to achieve those results, this is my 40 meter antenna. It's a 40 meter hamstick mounted on the desk behind me with a radial that runs out into the adjoining room. I wanted to show you the connections and how the ADX works. Basically, there are only four connections to the device. The microphone and speaker using a standard 3.5 millimeter stereo plug, which goes to the sound card on your computer. And up over here, you have the DC input, a maximum of 12 volts between 10 and 12, and a BNC connector going out to the antenna. Sitting on the back of the EDX is the installed low-pass filter. Now you manually select or change the filter depending upon the band you're using. So the options I'm showing here are the ones that I built for 10, 15, 20 is in the unit and 40 meters down here, which is ideally matched with the NFED halfway project that we actually went through recently. So the way the status lights and the buttons work, there are four status lights, which initially on power indicate the band that you have chosen, and whilst in operation it indicates the digital mode that's currently in use. There are three buttons, a left and a right button, a transmit button, and an LED to indicate when the, uh, the ADX is in transmit mode. You can choose which four bands you actually wish to use, and you program that into the Arduino. So you have four set bands of choice. And when you first power the ADX on, the red light flashes, then the band LED flashes three times to indicate which band it was on. I'll just do that again. You'll see that on my particular unit, it flashes three times on where I've marked as 20 meters. So that two, three, there we are. And then it defaults back to the mode that you're currently using. Now to change the mode of operation, you simply use the button and move it left or right to select the mode that you want. Now in this case here, that is now set to operate in FT8 on 20 meters, which is the install band. If I wish to change the band, I simply press both buttons together. It flashes three times to indicate the band which is currently selected and the transmit light comes on to indicate that you're in band configuration mode. You then select up or down, in which case I've now changed this to 10 metres, and of course I'd need to change out and put the 10 metre low pass filter in as well. I hit the transmit button to confirm, it flashes three times, and now there we are, back to FT8 on 10 metres. The last thing to demonstrate is the use of the transmit button. All this button does is simply put the transceiver into transmit by pressing, which enables you to tune the, uh, the antenna if you're using an ATU, or to ensure that you're actually getting or record the amount of power that you're getting out of the device. In case you were wondering what these particular items are here on the, on the cover, that's a modification that uh, Barb W2B2CBA made 
which enables you, if you wish to install pin headers on there, you can actually store your bandpass filters sitting on top of the device as a method of keeping everything nice and neat. So what we end up with is an absolutely beautiful little radio that you've built yourself and with which you can have hours and hours of fun learning about digital modes and getting on the HF bands and enjoying yourself. Don't worry, just as we did with the Enfin Halfway Project, we'll be there to help you every single step of the way and make sure that the journey is an enjoyable one. Now you will need to pre- So uh, that's just a bit of preamble that we put together for the radio club. And that goes on to say, look, you've got to get your orders in, you've got to pre-order, this is how you do it. But hopefully that gave you a feeling for the, the actual radio itself. So let's go and talk a little bit about um, how it's built, a bit of its origins, and a little bit about how it works. Um, so just bear with me while I swap all this back out. Pop that back down there. All right, so, sorry, let me just get back to uh, that here. probably only fair that I give Bob due uh, recognition here. Um, I've not personally met him, I've spoken to him many times, I've exchanged numerous emails, uh, but he's the guy that developed the, uh, the ADX. Um, he's also very instrumental in, you may have heard of the Micro SDX, which is a QRP radio, he was one of the designers of that uh, along the way. He also designed this fantastic little box that I've got here, it's called a barber watt. There is a, these are as rare as hen's teeth. It's a dummy load SWR meter and PAL meter for QRP, it's highly accurate. And um, he, 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 he sent that to me, so I, I treasure that. Um, please come up and have a look at that uh, if you will on the way through. Anyway, Barb designed this, but the 80, and he designed it specifically for clubs and, and individuals to be able to build relatively easily. That was his dream. That's what he, he set out to, to do that. So he was very supportive of what we, doing, we were doing at, uh, at Cowtown. But as I've indicated here, the ADX uses a, 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 pro, a mode called direct frequency shift keying. Now I'll, I'll go into how, what, direct, does everybody know what direct FSK is? Nope. Good, so I haven't wasted my slide space as I try to explain it to you and I'll, I'll do my best as I can. Firstly, the ADX is a digital only transceiver. It only supports digital modes. Well, what are digital modes? I mean, in, in some sense, Morse code is a digital mode. You're either transmitting a carry or you're not. You've got a beep or, a, or it's, it, it's, it, it's a dash or a da and a dit or a, whatever, you know what it is. Um, and. Uh, but it, it's a form of code. It, it's, it's, it's a digital thing. It's either on or it's off, and it, you know, you're depending on the length of time. But normally, with most digital modes, a computer encodes and decodes the digital signals that are then transmitted. So you generally pair it up with the computer to be able to do it. You can use various types of modulation modes, on and off keying, as in Morse code, frequency shift keying, which I'll be talking about, which is what FT8, some of the more popular uh, current digital modes tend to use. You can use phase shift keying and also sped, spread, so again, sped, spread spectrum techniques um, as we work our way through. What can you use digital modes for sending? Well, you can send text messages, you can have chat, you can have two-way communications between co computers such as FT8. You can send pictures, propagation testing using Whisper, the, the Whisper um, uh, protocol. And also it's used for uh, balloon telemetry. Um, I'm not sure if you're aware of it, but with the Whisper uh, system is used by balloons when you launch them and they go off a distance. It transmits its location, its height, its temperature and a few other parameters and so forth back to the ground. So they can use that for actually tracking where this balloon that's been launched is, uh, is located. Um, often it's a narrow band. Uh, we tend to use a lower bandwidth in order to improve the signal to noise ratio at the expense of speed. Um, it's often seen as low power, weak signal modes, although not necessarily always in that particular domain. It may or may not include error detection and it's generally well suited for QRP work. Um, now, in a typical setup, you generally have a computer that encodes the audio that the tones or encodes the digital uh, transmission, if you will, which is then passed to a standard transceiver, usually, uh, and, and just, just put out as, as a single sideband transmission that's carrying the various tones and so forth that are necessary. 
We tend to use digital mode software, WSJTX is the most popular, uh, but also JS8 Core for conversational um, stuff using FT8. FL Digi is another uh, common piece of uh, software that's used for various modes, but they all send and receive the audio tones to and from the sound card in the computer. Now, if you look at, for example, just CW Morse code in terms of how that's generated, usually, um, if you've got a fairly simple crystal controlled uh, transceiver, you basically have a, a contr crystal controlled oscillator, which in essence is fed straight through to a power amplifier and it just transmits that particular carrier on that frequency which you key on and off in terms of Morse code. Another way you can also do that is to have a tone which you key on and off, which you transmit through into a normal uh, sideband, uh, single sideband uh, signal goes through the uh, the mixer and you get an upper and lower sideband you have to then obviously filter out the carrier and the and the, uh, the the the, uh, the lower sideband and just transmit the uh, the upper sideband as it uh, as it works its way out clearly when you do that there's a whole stack of additional circuitry that is really just to effectively to to get rid of everything that you don't want so that you're only transmitting the thing that you, thing that you do except in the crystal controlled oscillator in that circumstance because that's about as simple as it gets well, in recent times, instead of using audio via a single sideband transceiver, um, it was developed, um, techniques became available where it was discovered you could actually generate the tone at the required frequency and then switch to, because a digital signal, if you ever, don't laugh when I try and mimic FD8, but you go, you know, it, it's effectively moving a tone. It's transmitting one tone, then it's transmitting another tone, then it's transmitting another tone. Well, by use of the computer, you can actually directly generate that tone and transmit the tones at the required two frequencies. So for example, in this one that's shown down the bottom here, if you're on FT8 on 40 meters, and you're transmitting at, uh, I think this was this example here, 1700 hertz audio, you can transmit a tone at 7.075.7, .7, and then you can vary that by the 50 hertz that you need to for the FT8 transmission, and it works. It's, it's simple, um, you don't have to have all the complex filtering and uh, to get rid of all the stuff that you don't need. You just generate that tone and then oscillate that particular tone that you're actually transmitting. By the way, I should give true uh, credit to these slides. I grabbed these from Hans Summers. He presented these particular slides at a uh, convention last year in the, in the US, so that's where they, where they came from. This particular technique was first used in a large-scale commercial way by Hans in his QDX transceiver. If you don't know what a QDX is, it looks like, that's one here. Beautiful piece of kit. I mean, it's a simple in terms of the way it looks. You, you can see here, um, you, you can either pay to get them built or you can build them yourselves from a, from a kit. This is one I built, um, works beautifully. Um, just to give you an indication, these are about $160 each, including the housing and freight. If you want to get one built, you have to pay an extra 50 US dollars, which is about 80 Australian dollars, and you can have it fully built for you. Um, there's two variants, a high band and a low band. This is a, the low band. Uh, it runs from 80 through to 20 meters. The high band variant, which I've got in kit form waiting still to be built. I've got too many other things happening, uh, which runs from, from 10 meters down to 20. So it fills in the top uh, bands, if you will. This was the really, as I said, this was really the first commercial unit that came out in force. It was a great success for QRP labs. And they, uh, they used that direct frequency shift keying technique for their uh, for, for digital modes. That went on to develop their latest one, which is the QMX, which is this beautiful piece of kit here. If you do pick it up, touch it, please handle it with care. Um, it's, uh, th these, that's the latest one from Hans. There's great future for this. It's likely to also have a single sideband as well. It also runs CW as well as all the, uh, the, uh, uh, the digital modes. It's not a build for the faint-hearted. So uh, these are a couple of pictures of the one that I built. Um, a few of us built, tried to build them in, in Fort Worth. I think I was the only one successfully able to do it first time around. Um, you can get them fully built by these guys themselves if you want. Um, I said the, the basic cost in Australian dollars at the current exchange rate is $198, including the housing and freight. 274 if you want it built and tested. 
but strap yourself in. There's currently an eight month waiting time. There's an eight month queue for these things to be uh, built. It's been a great success for them, but fantastic piece of kit. The first time I powered this up, I took it to the club. I, I built it one weekend, took it in, powered it up, connected up, because I, I was living in an apartment when I was in Fort Worth, so I only had limited antennas. When my wife wasn't there, I was able to get dipoles strung from the kitchen through into the two bedrooms. And uh, <laughs> you can imagine they had to come down each time she came back to Fort Worth. But, you know, fairly limited antennas. Anyway, we connected this thing up. I was running three watts into the, uh, in, in the antenna at the, at the clubhouse. And we just sat there gobsmacked as, as various people just worked all the way across, all the, down the uh, east coast of Africa and into, into southern Europe on, on, on three watts or so that we were putting out with that. It was just absolutely a whole lot of fun and, and amazing. But if you don't want to fork out that much money, you don't want to build such a complicated kit, the Humble ADX here, I'm not going to suggest for, for a moment that the ADX is an equivalent performer of those guys. It, it simply isn't. But it can still generate a lot of fun, and, you, and hopefully you'll, you'll see some of that uh, tonight. So the building blocks um, associated with the, with the ADX. So this is the... Uh, this is, if I took that top cover off and, uh, and had a look at the, the internals of it, this is what you'd, uh, you'd be seeing. Let's just break it down. The top left-hand corner there, you can see the incoming power supply is a standard 5.5 uh, by 2.1 millimeter DC plug. 12 volt input is, is the maximum. You can run, I, I normally run mine off uh, lithium iron batteries, um, but I forgot the cable tonight. So. Um, fortunately, th this is the next project that we're building for the, uh, the Cowtown Club. I brought that along to show you, and I'm not expecting to have to use it, um, but that's now actually powering the ADX. Um, but as I said, 12 volts, you can get away with 12.6, 12.8 or something like that. There is a diode that's going to drop about 0.7 of a volt on the way through. The limit of that is really around the input supply to the, to the Arduino, to the Nano. Um, that, that has a maximum of 12 volts, so if you go beyond that, you, you run the risk of blowing up your, uh, your Nano if you do. Um, the brain of the whole thing is actually the Arduino Nano. The, that's the, the microcomputer that's sitting there, just that little, little black thing down here. Cheapest chips, um, these things there. It's used for the signal generation of the audio tones that are uh, going out. It actually talks to the VFO, which is, the, I'll talk about that next here. Um, it's, it, so it's the user interface and it also is, helps calibrate the VFO. And it also provides the onboard 5 and 3.3 volt regulator to, for the supply voltages for the, uh, for the, the SI5351, for the octal buffer over here, as well as the receiver chip that's sitting over in that particular section. So it, it's a very practical use, if you will, of the thing on the way through. The audio interface is uh, relatively straightforward, just a couple of 3.5 mil audio sockets. Uh, one of them is providing the audio output, which takes the output directly from the, um, uh, the AM FM uh, chip that's on there. And the input um, from, the, from the computer goes through a series of bandpass filters before it passes across to the Arduino to make the necessary uh, smarts to eff effectively control the VFO to, uh, to get the output signal on the way through. VFO, as I said, it's a cheap SI5351, um, and the receiver also is a, a Chinese clone of the Toshiba TA2003GP. It's effectively an AM-FM radio chip. It's being used in this case as a direct conversion receiver, um, and, and I'm sorry if I'm using all sorts of terms which you'll get to as we, uh, as, as we go, go along there, but it's a direct conversion receiver. I will talk about the dash s modification which is the uh, uh, uses the super heterodyne capability of that same chip um, the transmit buffer is a an octal buffer uh, connected to the three bs 170s which are being used as the power amplifiers and in, in the right hand corner there and last but not least is the uh, the low pass filter section which effectively eliminates anything but the, uh, the the frequency that you want to transmit on the on the way through the user interface. Um, now, in the, the previous video I showed you, it spoke about there being four bands and how you navigate through them. Well, it's actually, this is actually a seven band variant. Um, I'll just, if I just jump out of this, I'll try and show you the, um, just a little two minute video, I think it runs three minute video which shows you how we 
modified it for seven bands. As standard, the ADX supports four band memories, or it has four band slots, band one, two, three, and four. And in the Arduino firmware, you load or you set the parameters so that you allocate which band you want to have in each of those four slots. And when you go into band configuration mode, you simply work your way through, you go left or right, and you can change the band that is the active band when you come out of that mode. So in this case here, just go back here, you can see I've allocated 40 meters, and I store that, and press the button, flashes three times, and now we go back to normal operating mode in FT8, with 40 meters being the selected band. When you power up the ADX, the first light that flashes will be the band that has been configured active in the ADX before you commence operations. Now, many of us in the Cowtown project actually uh, have more than four low-pass filters. We also may have an 80, 30, or 17, although the 40, 20, 15, 10 configuration here was the standard configuration that was supplied with the, uh, the firmware. So, as I needed to constantly swap these in and out for various testing and so forth, I decided to modify the ADX code, a fairly simple uh, modification to make, and it now supports all seven bands, and you can choose which of those seven bands you want without having to reconfigure the firmware and upload the firmware. And I'll just show you how I've done that. So let's go into band configuration mode by pressing the left and right button down together. It flashes three times, indicating the current selected band is 40 meters, and the red light remains on during the uh, band configuration mode. So we come along as normal, standard configuration 40, 20, 15, and 10, as we deployed with the Cowtown project. But then if you want to go to 80, 30, or 17, just keep going. Two lights come on, indicating that we're now on the top row. So this is an 80 meter selection, 30 meter selection, or 17 meter selection. So if I wanted to make 17 my standard, uh, my, my default band now on power, I just store that into memory. We go back into FT8 mode. Oh, sorry, now we have round whisper. I'm just going to go back and put it into FT8 as I change it there. I'll just power down the unit and then power it back on. And when we power back on, quick flash there, you can see now the two lights are flashing, indicating that we're on the 17 meter band. Fairly simple change. It's available in the firmware that I put on the uh, on the Cowtown Group's I/O page. Please feel free to download it and put that into your ADX. And um, hope you continue to enjoy the project. Okay, so that gives you a fair idea of how we built it, how the various controls work, and in terms of how we put the project together from a, uh, putting the kits, if you will, we, as I said, it was a group, group buy. Um, I was the schmuck that actually ended up doing the group buy. Um, I, look, my last job, I did a lot of international travel, so I was often not at home, so I had to get all the stuff sent to my office, and I'd come back from each trip, and my desk would look like a mail room. There'd be piles of uh, stuff that's being delivered on the, on the way through. But this is, this is what it looked like when we put it together as a kit. Um, here you can see that's the, uh, the kit that we, uh, with everything in, we pull it all out, there's all the various components through here. We put it together, we, we had a, cons a, kit, a kitting event, which was uh, basically a euphemism for getting as many suckers as we could to come along and spend the evening counting out resistors and putting them into uh, components into various packets to create the kit that uh, we've got here. Now we originally set out to do this for about 20, we started out with 20 kits. That was, that was the, the first buy that we went through. We ended up selling uh, just under 50. So we went from 20 and then we bought to 25, and then we went to 30, then we went to 40, and we went all the way up to 50 kits were actually uh, produced. So when I talk about the, excuse me, when I talk about the costing here, $30 was what we expected as a budget uh, when we we're doing 20 kits and $3 for each of the low pass filters. Um, we ended up being able to buy, if, if we're buying them in bulk up front, and so we're organizing and coordinating the, uh, the shipping, you can actually put these together, I'm sorry, this is in US dollars. 
So <coughs> you can actually put these together for about 20 US dollars, so about 30 Australian dollars uh, of that order, plus for each, uh, each low pass filter on the way through. We sold them for 30 dollars, that most of the club members were happy to pay 30 bucks for it, um, and the three dollars for the band pass filters. We actually made the club about one and a half thousand dollars Australian as a result of the uh, the sales, uh, and, and plus people generally threw in a couple of extra dollars because they were appreciative of what uh, they did on the way through. But you know, a fantastic little project, relatively inexpensive, a great learning experience. And look, while we were waiting for the, we, we took the orders. It took about five weeks for us to get all the parts together and, and assemble the kits before we were able to ship them back out. We had newsletters going out every week just talking about different assets, aspects of the, of the project to try and keep people uh, interested. And we actually built that. You can see that this is actually one of the slides that we used for the, uh, for the program. We started on the 8th of July last year with the, the constructing the low-pass filters. We then went on to had two supportive build sessions. We ended up having a couple of extras because some, you know, some people got it built in one night, so to speak. Others took a bit longer. Particularly, I mean, we even had people building this that had never soldered before. Um, so, you know, it was great. And, and look, one of the good things that came out of it was a lot of the Elmers in the club, it really got them fired up and they, they really got a, a lot of uh, joy out of working with some of the newer club members, teaching them how to solder, teaching them how to fault find and diagnose on the way through. And then we had the calibration event on the, uh, on the way through at the back. Um, I think one of the keys to success was, was this construction manual. Um, it's now in its fourth edition. Uh, if you want to have a look at it, it's in the front section of this, uh, this thing here. It literally is a blow-by-blow -blow description as to what to solder, where to put where, where to test, how to do it. Um, and uh, as I said, I, I put that together for each of the projects on, on the way through. And uh, Barb actually has this published on his website for anybody who wants to build an ADX to, uh, to, to grab that and use it. So that, that was a, a great uh, thing there. I also produced the, uh, the bill of materials and the, um, where I actually bought all of the components from. So, uh, and that's up on, uh, on, on, the, uh, on, on GitHub as well. Um, so any club can pick that up um, and uh, use, use the spreadsheet and actually order all the parts and, and bring, the, bring the stuff together on the, on the way through. I wanted to talk a little bit about the low-pass filters because I used to have a full head of hair before I took on this. Um, <laughs> the, we, when we set out to do it, um, we were looking, this, this is what, this is the type of low-pass filter we're looking to buy using the small, um, b because of the, uh, the, the torrid winding stuff, these things needed to be 100 volt uh, capacitors, high, uh, high tolerance 100 volt capacitors. Do you think I could source those in Fort Worth? I, it, m most of the majors just didn't have them and the, I could get them, but not small enough to be able to fit on those, uh, those filters. So you can also, um, use them using surface mount devices, as you can see here. So somewhere along the line, I'd never soldered a surface mount device before in my life, before this project, I can tell you. Um, I ended up going out, that was the only way I could source these capacitors. I ended up going and buying a hot plate, teaching myself how to uh, solder these things. And in one weekend, um, I placed and soldered over one and a half thousand surface mount devices oh. onto the low pass filters. This is half a batch of one of the um, bandpass filters for one of the bands. Uh, something like 260 bandpass filters were made on that week, that weekend of the six surface mount uh, capacitors on each one of those. Um, yep, glad I did that. Next time I'll be, they'll be, I'll, I'll be finding another way to do it uh, next time as we, as we went through. But, you know, th these are the bandpass filters. Got a great little uh, set of them there. In fact, um, on here, remember I said that the, uh, this was just for storing them on the top. Um, there's, there's one in the back there and I've got three other bandpass filters sitting on the top of the, uh, the, the device there. And somewhere in the bag over there, the other three that I uh, can't fit on the way through. Um, we spent a lot of time playing with bandpass filters. Um, it was a new learning experience for me. Um, I'd never wound a toroid before I built my first NFED half wave two years ago. Um, and um, and actually, nor had a lot of guys in the club. I mean, toroids and winding toroids and tuned circuits are always sort of black art and magic that nobody ever touched. You know, guys these days won't even blink twice about having to wind a toroid for, uh, for something on the way through. Um, but look, we, we did a lot of experimenting with, uh, with those. Um, the 
key to getting the, the ADX running effectively so that you don't overheat the finals is to get the low pass filter working. I went to a lot of trouble to actually tune them up and get them working perfectly bang on frequency only to discover that by doing that I destroyed the balance on the E-Class e amplifiers so they were running not as efficiently as they could so it was a matter of playing around with them we did a, a series of uh, tests in, in this case here this was showing you can see here um, winding this particular inductor here was the one that seemed to have the most impact on the efficiency of the uh, of the of the, uh, the ADX um, this is the impact of winding them, squeezing them together, running cool, but um, you know, the resonant frequency wasn't quite down at exactly where we wanted it. Um, this one here was where we, uh, what did I do here? Um, change the resonant point on that by increasing the inductance of L1. And then another one here, spreading them more evenly out. Uh, got fantastic, 70% efficiency, got 4.1 watts out, but the, uh, the power app, uh, power transistors became too hot to touch after 15 seconds of transmission. So, you know, it was a matter of just tweaking the low pass filter to work how you want it on each of the particular bands on the way through. I'm not going to go into the theory of the low pass filter, but uh, there's three sections. The low pass filter, the notch filter in the middle, and the DC feed filter for the uh, for the power amplifiers in the in the unit. A lot of people may be asking, how do these things stack up in terms of purity of transmission from a, um, a the harmonic rejection? We tested them all, um, and you can see here, I'll just quickly flick through these. This is, you can see every one of them meets the FCC standard in terms of harmonic suppression. So that was the 80 meters, 40 meters, uh, well over 50 dB below the fundamental, uh, 44 and 0.7 on 30, 46 on, the, uh, on 20, 42 on 17, 46 on 15, and 48 on 10. So, you know, very spectrally pure, if you will. So you could, you, could, you know, you use them with uh, with confidence. Just want to before I wrap on and just show you a quick live demo of the the thing going here. I wanted to uh, to just talk about a couple of uh, when I first started looking at these, it was a bit confusing because there were various models of ADX around. I was trying to put it all in, 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 into into place. When we first started doing it, um, in the midst of pulling everything together, Adam um, BD6CR of CR kits came out with a mod um, that uh, a Japanese amateur had uh, proposed to him, which effectively changed the, um, the from a direct conversion to a superheterodyne converted. And it, it, the, the CD2003 chip has the capability of operating both as a direct conversion and also as a superheterodyne receiver. Um, and he, where he lived and a number of people have a lot of broadcast interference when using a direct conversion receiver. So he came up with a mod uh, which effectively involved a, um, a ceramic crystal here and a uh, capacitor that you can see around through there. Uh, th these were just suggested improvement. It wasn't part of his mod that I, I put on there. But you, you could effectively, oh, sorry. He bought out a new board that already had that on there. This is how I worked out how to modify the, the standard ADX to do that. In fact, I put an instruction uh, pad together here for do it. Um, I did extensive testing with this and the receiver was, was as deaf as anything. And it turns out that by inserting the ceramic filter, you actually um, have a 6 dB loss on the, uh, on, on the receiver circuit. But he's found a way to overcome that. I'm sorry, so I couldn't get this thing going. I thought I must have really screwed up the modification. So I went and forked out $69 US to buy a kit from him. I built the kit and had exactly the same uh, situation as I did with the, uh, with the ADX. He subsequently put out some mods to the ADX-S, dash superheterodyne, to improve the receiver performance to overcome that. But we decided that we weren't going to do the mod um, and uh, we would actually just build the standard ADX on the way through. He's now also come out with a version 2 of the ADX-S, which um, has a, uh, a more accurate uh, crystal um, oscillator in the uh, reference crystal in the uh, uh, the VFO, the SI5351, to prevent drift. Because you do get, when you first power up the, the ADX, in the first two minutes as it warms up, you get a little bit of drift, about 100 hertz uh, or so. You, you can see that as, as you do. He also has added Bluetooth. And literally in the last two weeks, there's been a lot of discussion on Groups.io about a, another Japanese amateur 
who's actually determined that by installing a um, audio amplifier here, this is an LM 386, um, and modifying the code in the Arduino, you can actually use the the USB cable and avoid having to have a plug it in through a sound card. So you actually use the USB cable uh, as your uh, audio input and output to the uh, to the Arduino. So. I've actually got some LM386s sitting on my workbench and I'm eagerly looking to try and, uh, and try that as, as we work forward. But if I just talk about where the ADX has gone, I mean, Barb only published this literally just about two years ago, if you will, on, on the way through. So this was his original design um, and you can see that the Cowtown kit um, that, uh, by the way, this is in Australian dollars, I've converted it all here. So you, you can build one of these comfortably for less than 50 bucks. Okay, and by the way, if, you, if you're used to building kits, you follow the instructions, you've got the parts sitting in front of you, you can put it together in an evening. Um, you know, if you want to take your time and be meticulous all the way through, two evenings is the maximum it's going to take you. Um, if you've never built a kit before, if you've got somebody supporting you, holding your hand along the way, it could easily do it in a couple of evenings. You know, it, it literally is, um, is that. And from, as I said, from the, the club perspective, we actually did it over two formal morning sessions uh, with nine o'clock till midday sort of thing, three hour, two, three hour sessions. And people went away. Some people did a, a few bits and pieces themselves, but the, building the low pass filters is the usually thing that takes a little bit of time on the way through. And so there, um, you can buy a fully assembled kit from Jason Kits via Tindy. Um, he sells those for $85 each. They're already fully built and tested, um, but he does sting you $8 for each low-pass filter. So it only comes with one. Each low-pass filter costs you $8 on the, on the way through. By the way, you can build them for about two bucks um, on the way through. Now, Adam, as I said, took the ADX, modified to the dash S means the super heterodyne. And you can see here, he sells those for about, this is all in Australian, $106. If you want the version two, which has got the Bluetooth and the fancy crystal and a couple of other bits and pieces he sells those for 139 they're still kits though you still have to build them but they do come with a full set of low pass filters um, the uh, this particular here comes with, a, with the four um, filters the version 2 comes with the 7 so you get the 30 the 17 and the 12 meter band with that as well now as all this is sort of happening Barb decided that he wanted to take this this kit and rather than have the Nano sitting on the board, he wanted to develop as a, into an Arduino shield. Uh, those who are familiar with Arduinos know what an Arduino shield is. So that's where the uh, ADX Uno comes in, and that actually sits on top of a, an Arduino Uno, and here's the, the full deal. You just plug it on top of the, the Uno, load the code into the Arduino, and you're away. Um, he you can't, I don't, haven't been able to find anywhere where you buy these commercially, but all of the, the Gerber files, the bill of materials, everything you need to, to, to go out and build one, or if you're using JL's PCB or whatever, you can do that. They're available on GitHub. I don't know what the cost is to, uh, to put them together. Now, not to be outdone, uh, Scott Baker, uh, this is Scott over here, lives in Seattle in Washington, I think, in the US, um, had a, likes playing with these sorts of things. So he took the design and he said, well, look, rather than having a separate um, Uno sitting underneath it or the Nano plugged in, I want to build a PCB which actually has the, uh, the 8 mega processor on the board sitting there using all surface mount components, hence the ADX Mini. And I'm sorry, I, I have an ADX Mini. I bought it directly from Scott. Um, it's sitting at home somewhere in all my boxes. I can't find it at the moment. Um, but this, as you can see here, everything's on the one board all surface mount. You, anyway, the bottom line is you can buy those from Jason. He sells them on behalf, well, Scott, doesn't, Scott designed them. He said, look, I don't want anything to do with having to sell these or whatever. Passed across to Jason. Jason sells them. You can buy those fully built for about $105 with a single band pass filter. They work fantastically. I, I, I have one and I'm, it, it works extremely well. Not to be outdone, Scott thought about, well, look, I could probably do it better than that. I don't like having these two cables coming in for the, uh, for the thing. So he put a sound card on the, on the, on the, on the kit, um, and hence the, uh, the ADX Mini version 1.2 came out with added the sound card. Well, of course, Barb wasn't happy about that. He wanted to do better as well. So he, he went and developed what the ADX Pocket, which is, again, an enhancement of the Arduino Shield concept 
but now he's added to the to the pocket a sound card um, so you just have to plug it into uh, uh, a single USB connector on it. So you've got power, USB connector, and the, uh, uh, the antenna on its way through. Again, same, same bandpass filters on, on the way through. Not to be outdone, Scott went, then went ahead and produced the ADX Mini. Literally only came on sale a couple of months ago. Um, and that's quite an enhancement of, uh, of what we've got over here. Um, he's got a... Uh, he changed the design of the low pass filter so the actual software actually checks to make sure you've got the right filter installed before it will actually go into transmit. So one of the problems with cat control is you can change the frequency easily enough but you then also have to remember to manually go and change the low pass filter before you transmit. Well this actually checks the low pass filter um, he's got a resistor on there which he checks the resistance of a particular line and determines whether it's got the right low pass filter and if you don't have the right, right low pass filter in it won't transmit so it works its way through that again um, Jason is selling those on his behalf they're 160 bucks each uh, Australian with a single band pass filter and cop this additional low pass filters are $20 each well I think you probably end up making your own at that sort of uh, that sort of price on the way through the difference that these actually uh, on the low-pass filters, let me just see if I can go back. Oh, it's going to take me all back through the build. I won't bother doing that. On the low-pass filters on, on these, there's actually three toroids. But one of the toroids and one of the capacitors is common to every single band. So you actually only really need, the only difference is, is two toroids and four capacitors. And so what, uh, what they've done here, um, Scott put that toroid and the capacitor on the motherboard so that the, the actual low pass filter just changes out those two capacitors, uh, sorry, two toroids and four capacitors for each band as you, as you work your way through. Uh, there's the last one I said there. So look, if, if I don't know whether the club wants to give it a crack and, and, and try and build an ADX, I'd, I'd be happy to steer you along that journey if, that's, if there were enough starters wanted to, uh, to give it a go. Um, but the documentation, um, I don't, did you put, post these presentations to a club site or anything like that? No, not yet, but oh, you can. You can, okay. Well, look, the, the, if, if, you, if you want to get the, take a photograph of that, I'll hold up there at the, at the end. There's the GitHub site where I put all the documentation for the Cowtown project. Barb's uh, site there is, is shown there as well. And also um, the Cowtown video promoting that can be seen there. Um, look, I, just thought, I thought I was pretty proud of that, actually. But Barb wrote back, after, after we did that and said, look, thanks guys, really appreciate you doing this project. It, it truly was wonderful to see. That's what he designed it for. So he uh, gave us all a big vote of thanks for actually doing that and promoting it. A couple of other clubs in the, the greater Dallas-Fort Worth area are, are currently going through the process this year. They'll be building those. And uh, you know, if you're half interested, I encourage you to give it a go. Even just if you didn't do it as a club event, a couple of individuals wanted to do it, I'd be happy to help you along that, uh, that journey. Um, there's a series of, if you want to have a look at some of the, these videos, just go to YouTube and search Cowtown Amateur Radio Club. They have a channel there, lots of videos there. There's a few that I put together. Uh, I haven't made a YouTube video before last, the beginning of last year. That one that I just showed you was the first one I'd ever made. Um, but it, it, we got the ones there for the NFED Half Wave. That's a presentation I gave. Um, the, uh, I, I am interested in fox hunting. We, we put together a few fox hunts and built antennas and um, uh, sniffers for, for those folks there. So there's some of the stuff, but there's information there if you want to uh, want to go and have a look at it. Um, yeah, look, I mean that's just the a blow up of that slide. For those familiar, not familiar with with um, uh, Grid Tracker, because um, <clears throat> I'm about to go and show you Grid Tracker, I'll just use this to explain. Um, you're not going to see uh, this time of night on 20 meters for anything quite uh, quite like this in the US, but effectively these squares are. Um, stations that are being heard, the little yellow dots are what I call my, my spots where people have actually heard me. So when I'm transmitting, they've reported back through to the, the server that I heard this uh, station. So if I mouse over that, that will tell me the signal strength that I was heard at uh, that particular location and when. And the, the yeah, it's probably beyond the scope of this evening to explain too much about uh, that as we go. Um, one of the things that you can use with um, with the ADX, it is, does work as a whisper beacon. So if those are familiar with the, the whisper system, um, it's, it's an operating mode. You just go to WSJTX, select whisper, put it into whisper, fire it off, let it go, and it will just sit there beaconing away for as long as you uh, you want to, to do so. 
Make sure your low pass filter is tuned so it doesn't get too hot in the two minute transmission segments that you have within, uh, within Whisper. Um, and look, just in case you're wondering what we're doing uh, this year, um, I'm still a member of the Cowtown Club. I join their meetings via Zoom each time they, they have them. Um, I've still got my hand up to help them with the projects uh, this year. Um, the guys are finishing off a low pass filter project for the ARRL field day coming up in, in July, uh, in June, I'm sorry. Um, and then this year, we're looking at two. The first one is this box here, which as I said, I hadn't planned to use, but I left my cable for my battery to run the ADX uh, at home. So I had to swing this into use. This is a, um, um, a linear power supply, two and a half watts, uh, two and a half amps, um, with pre-selected voltages, current limiting, variable supply, and, and various other bits and pieces together with uh, cooling, what have you. It, one of the things that we found when we were building um, the, these uh, devices was that people didn't have a, a lab power supply at home. So if you connect it to a battery and you've got a short, you're gonna burn something out. So having a, a current limited power supply was a really neat way to do it. Um, this thing is actually taking a $4 um, Chinese power supply. You can buy them literally four US dollars, a little bit cheaper. Um, and I'm putting various things around it, putting in a nice housing. And for less than 30 bucks, you're gonna get a very nice little uh, usable and can you see now how that works with everything else that we've got going? Uh, I'm now using it in the, in the here to power the ADX, which is not connected to an end-fed halfway, but if I could also put the ATU in there if I wasn't uh, working its way through. All right, the moment you've all been waiting for, does it actually work? Let's see. <laughs> um, okay, let's just close down the power, this one here. Oh, sorry, you can't see a thing. So I've had it off monitor whilst we've been here doing all this. I've got some uh, uh, monitor. Here we go. So this is running live. And the, the cable that you can see running across there is just going connected to one of the antennas out in the out in the back. Let me just, uh, this was running earlier on this evening. It's probably not a lot of activity. On t oh, there's, a little, there's a little bit of activity out there. I'll just clear this so I can. Okay, so do I need to explain what's happening here for anyone or has people seen FT8 running before? Some of us have, some of us haven't. All right. So, um, okay. What you've got in this area here is FT8 works in 15 second segments. So it listens for 15 seconds. And during that, it basically the computer um, decodes the range of frequencies that are coming in on that uh, and is able to grab from the spectrum. Um, wasn't ready to talk to this, but let me just see how I go. Have you stopped the recording? <laughs> no, no, it's all right. You keep, I'm just about to make a fool of myself as I try and explain <laughs> FT, FT8 un, uh, un, uh, unprepared as I am. Um, okay, so the, the, the way FT8 works is basically it transmits a, a series of tones 50 hertz apart within a standard um, audio spectrum. So you generally got a, you know, a standard channel is about 2.8 kilohertz. Um, and within that, you've got a whole series of different transmissions taking place. What you're seeing at the bottom here is a, a, a band scope on, on basically at the moment on, on 20 meters, 14.074. Here you can see the 2.8 kilohertz segment. And these, the shaded areas here are where it's actually hearing signals. So think of it as this, this section here, this section here, this section here, are individual channels that are coming in. So that's a, a communication. Now, all those sounds get fed into the, uh, the computer's digital signal processor. It parses them, it, it's able to work out what's going on, and then it displays up here all of the, um, the, the, the what it receives in each 15 uh, 
second segment. So you can see here BG60QI, or six for Oscar Quebec India, a Chinese station in, in Maidenhead. I can't read those glasses. Oscar Mike 64 is calling CQ. Now, everything that comes in, so I can, let's just try and go back to this guy. So I've, I've just double clicked on that. That's the problem with using the sound. I just realized it's not, the sound isn't going to the right spot. It's not that one. <laughs> Um, I, I adjusted the sound so that the sound was going when I was playing the videos going through the uh, the thing here I've just got to try and work out which sound which um, sound output I need it's not that one Tell you what, why don't we have a coffee break? <laughs> I'll, I'll get the, uh, the thing, but effectively look, you can see it's working on receive at the moment. I just need to, I just need to reprogram the sound so that it goes to the ADX and not to the speaker system and what have you in here. Um, but the, um, this, this is what's showing on receives. So let me just zoom grid tracker in here. So right now, what, what happens, this software sends the information to this piece of software, which then plots the information that's coming on here onto, onto the map. So you get a, a representation of what's actually going on. So this is me sitting down here. Um, and you would have seen that just flicker there and a whole series of signals were decoded in that 15 second segment. And it's now plotted on, the, on this map here where it's heard each of those. So, each signal comes through with a maiden head locator, a grid square, and then this software plots that grid square on the uh, on the map here. So this one here, you can see there the the green indicates somebody calling CQ, the the purple indicates somebody that's actually being heard. So there's somebody calling CQ over there in Indonesia. There's a couple of stations up in China that are calling CQ, three of them in fact. And it can also hear conversations that are taking place at the moment with some stations in, in Japan. Now, 20 metres is probably falling away at this time of night, so we're really catching the dregs. You can see the grey line coming across here as the grey line works its, works its way. I haven't been able to find a, uh, a tunable 40 metre antenna in there, so we, I could have put 40 metres on, which would be more effective at this time of night than, uh, than 20 metres is. But um, I, I did ask somebody, I said, uh, no, no, don't look, we'll, we'll, we'll play, we're on play around. I can play around all night if you want, but I don't want to hold everybody up while we, while we play around. Oh, we're happy to play. You're happy to play, all right. Well, let, let me get the, um, um, well, in fact, to prove that I actually, I said yeah, this. We want to see it working, Rich. You want to see it working, all right, yeah. let's, let's, let's get it. Why don't we just take a break, let me sort out the audio, and then for those that want to see it working, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll do that. So let, let's call it officially to hold there, and then I'll get it going to, for people to see after that. All right. Thank you. 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 Yeah. So, so I, this guy was calling CQ. I went back to him. He, he's, he's answered me. And he. How many dB down or up? Okay, so I, I gave him minus 18. He gave me minus 13. He's acknowledged it. Roger, Roger, 73s. I've got 73s here. So that's just pop that up here. And so. So that's a confirmed QSO. So I can now just log it. And you log it. With, how do you how do you log it? So it 
WSJTX logs it itself, but actually the grid tracker is actually connected to my QRZ account. So if I... Yeah, um, so you can, you can link that to other logging software? You can, you can log book of the world, a variety of yeah, other yeah. ones. So, so it automatically uploads it. And it, it does. You can chase DXCC if you want. Mm. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Um, <laughs> The uh, I, I actually worked all states in the United States wow. using the ADX wow. um, with a whip antenna in my apartment. Yes. Uh, you got New Hampshire, did you? Your wife was out. <laughs> no, no, my wife was there. The, the, see, the beauty about when you're living in a two bedroom apartment, you're using um, FT8, you don't have to talk. <laughs> <laughs> right? So, <laughs> Radio waves are so, so you can be, uh, the, the, there you go, look, I just um, haven't used much of this. I just logged those two, it's actually the same guy, um, same station. I logged him, this is when I logged him earlier when I was testing it out. Yeah. And this is, uh, in fact, this guy, I, I checked it out last night to make sure it was working before I put it in the bag. And I worked this guy up in New Caledonia. Um, there's, there's a two Chinese, that's the con Chinese contact I just made. Let's just go and see if we can find someone else. Um, do you QSL? Sorry? Do you send QSLs electronically or the, No, the, the QRZ automatically QSLs for you. Does it? Yeah. And That's cool. So when, when you're looking at... Um, Q, yes, it does. Yeah. When, you're, when you're looking at QRZ... Yeah. Here, yeah. Yeah, I knew that. See, see this here? So the star indicates that he's QSL'd me. Okay. So that, that's a, that's a, yeah, a two-way electronic Q QSL. You know what? Not so long ago, I got a card from Europe for a PSK31 QSL I had 14 years ago. It probably... <laughs> how times have changed. I, they, they, they have... <laughs> it worked the guy two minutes ago. And <laughs> with, with, with Grid Tracker, when you're doing this, uh, let me just... Where's the logging? Logging here. You see, you can log automatically to any of these type of um, log book of the world. Um, can't quite see it without my glasses. Um, QRZ, PSK reporter. Okay, so this, this Indo sorry, just quickly back here. The Indonesian's just come back to me. In fact, I've just had to confirm QSO with him. Let me, uh, let me. Are you running full loss? Uh, yes, 3.8, I think, on the moment. Who else you can find, um, Okay, let me just get rid of this. Sorry, let me just close that. The little red box just in the Ah, there it is. Thank you. Yeah, it's all out. Of, it's all out of focus. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I just worked the JK. Actually, J Japanese, I suspect. JK one HAK. Um, so that's been done. Let's see. Oh, didn't. Okay. They said it made an error, so it wasn't able to successfully upload the entry to uh, to QRZ. Um, but th this this is all actually kept in a log, so I can actually open up the log and see what I what I've recorded and actually enter it in manually if I if I wish to. Um, let's have a look. Who else have we got? Going? Strong red signal. There. Strong red signal. Yeah, there is too. Red on the. So if you read, yeah, you can read on the cursor over it. Up here. No, no, down, 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 in the spectrum. Oh, here. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right. yeah I, I generally don't like if somebody's coming in that strong, it means they're not use it. They, you know, you're supposed to use very small amounts of power. Somebody's probably sitting there with a hundred watts yes. into a Yagi. Yeah. Um, I, I tend to try and avoid those. But uh, let's see what else we got going on here. Oh, it's ZL. It's ZL. Where's the ZL guy? This guy. Yeah, that's the 811. Yep, yep. Oh, yeah, um, just see what yeah. comes in in the next uh, round, see who's calling CQ. Where, where you can see this little ant trail, mm -hmm. it's actually hearing both sides of that communication. Oh, this one, nice have you worked him? Let's try this guy. OQI, I think was that the guy I worked before? No, I haven't worked this guy yet. So 
let's not lose sight of the fact that this is a fifty dollar radio yeah, yeah, that you that you've built yourself in a couple of hours. Yeah, yeah. And we can do that for the five thousand dollar radio. <laughs> 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 The, 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 there's a different level of satisfaction when you yeah, use the. Right. Uh, look, I, I've got. I mean, I've got. I've got an ICOM 7300. Uh, when I I just retired at the end of last week, and the guys in the office bought me a, a Yaesu FT 10DX, um, which I haven't even taken out. I haven't even taken out of the box yet because I keep playing with these things, and also I haven't got everything set up at home. But um, yeah, that guy doesn't look like he wants to come back to me. Try this guy. <laughs> now, the, the remember I spoke about spots, so you can you, if I zoom in on this here, see these little yellow dots here. They're people that have actually heard my signal or reported that they've heard it on the way through. So. It's got, yeah, he spotted me. So I've, I've got minus eight into that part of China. You see, I'm being spotted all the way through Japan. Lots of, lots of, I'm being heard all the way up through there through Japan. Now, we, the fact that I've got so many here, and I'm, I'm getting heard occasionally through here, tends to be that the, you know, the, the pattern is actually all landing in that area. It's just that not a lot of people in China have got uh, this sort of gear to be recording it. Yet, a lot of the Japanese amateurs all are on the way through. They're all through here. We've got an Indonesian calling CQ. Here's that uh, YC8. Can't, can't, can't read it. Can anyone see something Alpha Delta? There he is. I've actually worked him. I'll try. I'll go again. This guy's calling CQ USA. So they're spotting you, they're also loading up the QRZ, I take it, aren't they? Yeah, so, well, not th that's right. No, no, to uh, Grid Tracker or the, whatever server they're using. So they've got a piece of software that's hearing me and they've reported that I've been heard at this date, this time, this frequency, this mode, um, at this signal strength. And so all I've got to do is then just mouse over where that spot is landing. Let's have a look at one a bit more local. Somebody up in just south of Brisbane. So. VK2ARL is hearing me at minus five. Uh, it tells you when, when he heard me, you can't read it. Mobile distance. Time, yeah, the time, time stamps down the bottom. And so the spots are only displayed um, for 15 minutes. So you can vary that so you can say, look, I only want to hear anyone that see, heard me in the last 10 minutes, the last five minutes um, on the way through. Um, and I'm sorry? Yes, there's a dot in Perth, so I'm being heard over in Perth, minus 17. Um, down in Melbourne, somebody's hearing me, VK3. I haven't got my glasses for that distance. Um, Bob. Um, yep. Um, anyone over in New Zealand? Yeah, somebody up in North Island, New Zealand is hearing me. Off, obviously, obviously a side lobe off the beam. Um, Uh, so, so this guy's not responding. Um, so I'll just cease trying. Yep, let's do that. See what we get. Let's find a clear spot. Uh, let's go down here. Yes, sorry. Uh, I'm one of this, but, but, but sorry, what does ADX stand for? Arduino Digital Transceiver. Yeah, very good, thank you. Um, and secondly, you said you're using the SI chip, SI... 5351. So you said you sourced the components. 
Yes. So did you source that on the, on the board, like a, a, a so, so board? It cut the, the, you were seeing that purple board? You, you buy that as a yes. complete unit. Yes. Yep. For about so two, two bucks. How do, um, how do you find the, the frequency accuracy of those things? So I'm saying this because I'm right now I'm talking to uh, Bruce, BK, Corner and Q, and also uh, Owen Duffy. And they've recently purchased some of these things, and the frequency accuracy is absolutely appalling to the extent that that um, Owen's rewriting the software to be able to calibrate them properly. So, so they seem to be these these cheap ones are just that these <coughs> rubbish crystals, apparently. I would say so. Um, I mean, <coughs> we, we use cheap ones, and virtually every time that they, they nailed it uh, in terms of uh, the, the frequency, you ca you do. That the software in the ADX enables you to calibrate the SI5351. Because Bruce is finding some of his were more than, um, more than two and a half kilohertz out. Mm -hmm. I've never had one that far out. Yeah. They've been. Um, you saw that Adam had that little modification where he put a, a highly accurate crystal yes. and replaced the ones on there to do that. He sells those separately for nine bucks, including postage, if, if, you, if you want one of those. Um, for the most part, I've only seen them out by a couple of hundred hertz, the ones that we've been using. You, you can buy, I mean, I've, I've bought about 60 of them I probably trashed about three in, 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 that, in that lot. Um, you can, some of the guys bought them from um, uh, Adafruit. The, the, yeah, it's a, a company in, in the US. Yes, they are. Yeah. 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 Um, and they're, they're about. These ones that are apparently questionable. I think it's, it, it, it's, it's luck of the draw. They do. They do. They 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 source the chips and they they make them. Uh, yeah. Um, so what have we got? We're in the middle of a QSO with the Japanese station. Hopefully we'll get a seventy three. Come on. Yep. Without success. Now hopefully if we've got the Wi-Fi working, when I click OK. No error came back, so I reckon I successfully just logged that. In fact, yeah. why don't I take a look? Um, and just refresh it. Yep, there we go. Both, in fact, both those Japanese stations got logged. So, I mean, if that doesn't encourage you to spend 50 bucks and go and try and build one of these things at home, what does? <laughs> um, I'll just keep calling CQ, see if anyone else comes back. just need the, need the time to add another project. <laughs> That's right. Well, we should do it with the club then. Yeah. So the, good, the good news is, Richard, you don't have to roll four knocks to uh, pay for it. You, you, you don't. You don't. <laughs> Look, I, and, and I, I've... <laughs> it's... When, you, when you've got all the stuff together, um, and I, I've, I've probably got enough stuff sitting at home to make probably, I'd have to buy a few bits and pieces, but I've got, I've got at least 15 boards. I, I made a mistake. I, I ordered the, the board using 1.2 mil thickness instead of 1.6 on, on one. And so I've got 20 of these boards. They're perfectly fine. They're just not as sturdy as the, uh, as the other ones. And I just couldn't, in, in own consciousness, supply those. So I ended up buying another set. So I've got, I got 15 or so of these things sitting at home waiting to, to be built. Another one, who have I got now? Now the Japanese stations come back. Yeah, I, I mean, the, the, the other thing that I, I do to find where I get a lot of enjoyment out of, out of using this is I actually sit there, I've got multiple screens at home. And on one of the screens, I keep QRZ open, and each time I work someone, I, I type in their, their call sign, and I actually get all their details. So there's usually a picture of the person I'm talking to, where they're living, a bit about their station, all those sorts of things, which just adds another interesting dimension to it. The, the other thing is, um, there's a lot of fun working, chasing down some of the DX awards. 
So, you know, as I said, I, I worked all states in the US using uh, FT8. And, you know, you, you get to the stage where there, when you're hunting, it, it's, it's like going fishing, you know, you, you don't care who's calling, you're after Montana or you're after somewhere like that, and you, you're just keeping a constant eye out for somebody to pop up in that state so you can pounce on them and get a confirmed QSO into uh, that area. So we just successfully worked that guy. Still don't understand how you got New Hampshire. Patience. <laughs> Patience and lots of it. Um, actually, for me, Alaska was the hardest to get oh, okay. because I wasn't using, because I had such inefficient antennas. Um, getting the, uh, I mean, firstly, there's not a lot of hams up in Alaska by comparison to the rest. And I, th I, I think, to be honest, I actually got that one from the radio club, uh, which was 400 metres away from where I lived in my apartment, which was, uh, was fortuitous. Um, with a better antenna. With a better antenna, yeah. Uh, although, by the time I, I was originally doing all the stuff using the, um, uh, the mobile whips, you know, you saw that picture there. I literally just put the, the magnetic base, which was quite heavy, put it on the, the desk behind me, ran the, a radial through into the bathroom, the spare bathroom there, and uh, successfully... I, no, I didn't know. It, was, it ju just ran out through there, and, and that was enough to get out and, and start having QSOs around the place. It wasn't enough to be able to sort of say, you know, you couldn't get a really good, reliable signal into certain areas. Well, as I said, when the wife went back to Australia, I had the apartment to myself for a while and I wasn't travelling. So I actually put a, uh, I had a, a 20 metre and a 15 metre dipole um, sprung from the, it was ha on the lights in the kitchen that went out into the bedroom and bathroom and that side of the bedroom and bathroom and that side. And that worked beautifully. And Russ, you'd be allowed to do that. Um, I have to give my wife a couple hundred bucks to go away for the weekend. <laughs> and and I, I would change the orientation if I was trying to get into a particular area. Um, run no, I didn't. Yeah. Twenty meters was the most I could really get on the on the dipole. I, I was on the fourth floor of a four-story apartment complex, um, so I had good takeoff angles in most uh, most good, good clear takeoff in most directions. A vertical dipole, except I had a power line running just outside my apartment, so I wasn't keen to throw too much out of the window. But um, anyway, does that give you a flavour? Yeah. All right. Yeah. So. I looked at this the other week, but now I know what I'm looking at, so that's good. Ah, oh, that's it's it. Not easy. It's, okay. it's an intermediate build, mm -hmm. but that's a very good receiver. Yeah. yeah. Probably you know, twice as sharp okay. as what you've got in there. Yeah. All right. Yeah, very so, cool. Thank well, you. About 15 or 16 hours then to build it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, make sure you've got a good soldering iron, mm -hmm. good quality solder, yeah. um, cases. and check yeah. every single yeah. solder yeah. again and again when, you, when, you, when you've done it. Yeah. I think it was, this is fighting bloody toroids. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I've found more toroids in the last 12 months than most.